God, I pray that is true, that we become more aware of your presence. God, scripture and nature and everything around us teaches the reality that it says that it's in you we move and live and have our being. It is your Holy Spirit that animates all of us and gives us breath in our lungs. I love the bridge of that song. May we become more aware. We don't need to invite you to be here, God, because you are already here. We don't need to ask you to show up into any space because you went before us. You have always gone before us. You are in the brightest of places and the darkest of places and unexpected people. Even here in North Park in this church, God, you are living and active. May we become aware of it. And may we see the glory of your goodness. May you be honored this morning, Jesus. I pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Good morning. You can have a seat. Welcome to Maker's Church. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. It is summer, as you can tell by being in this very warm room. Uh, I recently bought a grill. First grill I've had in like 15 years. We finally have a backyard. Yes, you can, you can clap it up for grills. Um, my wife has, we have a baby on the way, due in less than three months now. So I feel like I need to up my dad game and getting a grill. What's more dad than that? Just, so this whole week... We've been making food, we've been eating out in the backyard or on the front porch, just enjoying a little sunset breeze. I can't wait to get all the ridiculous, stupid dad joke aprons. She got me a Yes Chef one already from the bear. It's, it's been great. I hope you're having a good summer so far. We're excited that you are here. This morning's going to be a little bit of a pivot sermon-wise. So originally what we had slated for today was a talk around this concept, Here for Good. Specifically, we're going to share some really exciting news about some building updates, some construction for the future. We pushed that to July, so you don't want to miss that. July 28th, there's going to be all kinds of great um, insights and information that we're going to share with you. It's going to be incredible. I decided to keep that title here for good because we've used it for years now, this church, as sort of a double meaning. Originally, it was hey, we're here for good. Because if you know us, if you know our church history, we've been nomadic. We've bounced all over the city. South Park, North Park, different spot in North Park, a couple places downtown, Point Loma, back here, all over. Every, like, two years, we'd be in a new location. And so finally, since 2019, we have been here, rooted and established in North Park. We are here for good, here for the long haul, here to stay. Even more so than that, we want to be here for good. We want to be goodness. We want to be blessing in this city, specifically this neighborhood. Our hope, our dream, our desire is that you can feel the difference of makers being here in a positive way. We hope that the businesses, the community, the art, the vibrancy, the creativity, families, connections is stronger and more vibrant because of our presence. We believe that is God's purpose for his church all over the world. That neighborhood cities feel and taste different in a positive way because God's people who are being transformed in his goodness are there. So we want to be here for good. We're going to unpack that a little bit this morning. We're going to talk about it more in, in, in the end of, Ju- end of July, but we're going to get into it today as well. We are still technically also in this long series about Peter. Perhaps the most interesting, charismatic, flawed disciple of them all. And it's interesting and probably not coincidental that yesterday was the church's saint day for Peter. But not just Peter, for Paul as well. Many of us don't know church history, but for thousands of years, the Christian church has celebrated June 29th as the Apostle Day, the saint day. And in a very strange way, it's not just for Peter, it's for Peter and Paul. It's very unusual to have two saints celebrated on the same day, but that is fascinating, and I gives context for this morning, and I love this quote. This is from St. Augustine. He wrote this back in 300 AD, a long time ago. He said, both of these apostles share the, share the same feast day, for these two were one. Even though they suffered differently, they were one. Peter went first, and Paul followed, and so we celebrate this day made holy for us by the apostles' blood. So let us embrace what they believed, their life, their labors, their sufferings, their preaching, their joys, and their confession of faith. If you recall, last year, we spent a whole year going through this thing called the Book of Common Prayer. 
incredible resource. I still read it almost every day. It's got devotionals, songs, and I had this yesterday. I want to quote. I think it's great. It says, one of the ways that we see the wisdom of the early church is their placing of Peter and Paul's saint days together so that they have shared celebration, thereby making sure that there was no room for divisions over their leadership, even with their disagreements. We see in the book of Acts, they had a few disagreements, but we also see deep love and respect for each other. The early church was quite clear that the first pastor, who was Peter, and the first theologian, who was Paul, held to, are to be held in equal respect and equal balance of authority. Without, one without the other leaves us incomplete and unbalanced. We are living in divided times. I don't need to tell you that. And I think that's a powerful word for us, that the church from the beginning saw that there are the appeal, there's the, 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 the allure to try to pick camps, pick sides, pick someone that you want to champion. And in this regard, the church said, we're going to put Peter and Paul together because you're going to want to pit them against each other. But they're on the same team, the same side. They said that. I love this. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He said, my brothers and sisters, there are some from Chloe's household who have informed me that there are quarrels among you. He's like, Chloe's spilling that good tea. You guys are fighting. And he says, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. The other says, I follow Apollos. He was another famous preacher of the day. And another still says, I follow Cephas. That was the Aramaic name for Peter. Still another trying to be extra holy. I follow Christ. You all, follow, I follow Jesus. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in Paul's name? He's like, you, I didn't die for you. And then he says, as one plants another waters, but God made it grow. I bring that up to give context, to bring framework, to bring flavoring to the sermon. We see from the life from Peter and Paul that there is such power when the church is united around the most important things. The way of Jesus, being here for good. When we have that as our true north, our anchor that roots us and propels us forward, Incredible things happen. A beautiful things happen. It says in John 15, 16, Jesus said this, I did not choose you, but I chose, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear good fruit, fruit that will last. And that happens when we do this. Last weekend, uh, I got news that one of my cousins passed away in a very tragic situation. And uh, we were very close growing up. Hadn't really talked in the last 10 years. And that fact was doing a number on my head and my heart. And it was interesting. Um, I had another cousin five years prior, different side of the family, who also died in a very tragic way. And that first cousin, I had to go fly home to Sacramento to do the eulogy. I was asked to do that. Um, and it was weird, just even this last week, just thinking that juxtaposition of my wife has this life growing inside of her. And it's that she's 27, almost 28 weeks, so baby girl is moving a ton. It's like there's a little alien in there. Like it's cute and also creepy to see like her stomach just getting kicked and stabbed and like the baby's like doing gymnastics in there. And I get to see it and I'm talking to baby girl a lot and I'm... Uh, playing songs and guitar for her. I'm singing, I sang a worship song over her. I'm like, baby, don't worry, there's better voices. When you come out, you're going to hear much better voices here at Makers. I'm, I've got a terrible voice. I inherited that from, from my father who's a musician. But I, I loved getting to do that with her. And it, it, was, it was weird to have that duality of this new life that's growing and, and going to spring forth. And if you know our journey, there's been a lot of loss in that pregnancy story as well. And then just to have my cousin, a father of two, just gone. And again, thinking five years ago, the eulogy I had to give. And I remember in that moment, I, I was, my brain went to like, eulogy is a weird word. Have you ever had that in moments of like stress or chaos? Your brain goes to strange places. I was in a car accident once. And before the car had even stopped moving, I was like thinking about what I was going to make for dinner. <laughs> Which is not weird because food's on my brain all the time. But afterwards, I'm like, why was my brain thinking about that while I'm in this like dangerous situation. I don't know if you've ever had that. Sometimes time slows down and our minds go to strange places. And as I was preparing, I was flying home years ago for a different cousin who passed. It's like, what is, eulogy is a weird word. Like, where does that come from? And if you break it down in the Greek, it just means 
good word. To speak a good word. And then I went down this rabbit trail of how Jesus himself was called the word. The word, the truth, the life. And it was through the word of Jesus that all goodness issues forth and enters the universe and into our souls. And I was like, man, I, I want to be a good word. I want my life to be a good word. And that's going to shape this sermon today of what does it mean to be a good word? And what does it mean to be here for good? So we'll break down those three words just a little bit and we'll, we'll close with that. But here, here for good, here. What does it mean to be here? Derek talked a lot about this last week beautifully when we were talking about vocation and calling. Of We're all in a place. Yes, physically here, but just in life. You all have spaces that you inhabit be it a neighborhood, be it families, be it jobs, be it ministries, be it hobbies, places that we play. What was it? Play, pray, and work. At work. Was that it? Did I say it right? What was it? Live, work, and play. I messed it up, but you get, you get the gist. We have these spaces that we exist, we inhabit. What does it mean to be good in those spaces? If you're like me, I often gravitate towards the future. I'm planning, I'm scheming, I'm strategizing, I'm dreaming about what's next, about what can come, what can be possibilities. It's really beneficial sometimes. It's beautiful. It's one of the things that makes us human. But it also pulls me out of the present. And I sometimes forget to notice the here and now. Like I'll be totally transparent, my day job, kind of bored there right now. I'm not loving it at the moment. And I'm contemplating career changes, job changes, whatever. And it's easy for me to forget the coworkers I have now. How can I be present and, and engaged in their lives? And not just let my brain traverse me to the next place. But, but how can I actually be here for good in that moment? To maximize wherever I'm at in that place. That's a beautiful thing. And where you're at now probably won't be where you'll be in a year, five, ten years. And maybe you're just hoping like, okay, when, when all the ducks get in a row, then I can really settle and be content and, and, and then do good or whatever the thing is. It's never too late to start. Right now is the perfect time to start wherever you're at. It's hard to do. I love this quote from a, a friend, Justin Roberts, who says this. He says, in order to appreciate and enjoy and maybe even love whatever it is, sometimes we must let go of what we think should be. Have you ever had that where what could be or, or what should be robs you from the joy of the moment? So being here for good starts with recognizing with wherever we're at. We don't need to seek something perfect because perfect's an illusion. You'll keep chasing it. Or when you say, okay, when I, when I finally get this, and again, there's nothing wrong with goals. Goals are amazing. They're good. You should have them. But if you believe the lie that contentment is always on the other side of something, you get there and your brain makes a new goal 10 feet farther ahead. And you're always chasing this elusive phantom you'll never capture down. So, so the secret, as Paul teaches us in scriptures, is to begin to learn how to have joy and contentment right here right now. There's, there, there's something special to it. And, and kind of in the, this line of vocation that Derek talked about last week, there was this famous story, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, one of the reformers, the great reformers. Someone came to him, they were a shoemaker, and they had, they had discovered Jesus and, and given their life to Jesus and said, Martin Luther, okay, I, I'm following Christ with my life. What do I do now? Do I enter seminary? Do I become a priest? Do I become a missionary? Do I serve the poor? What, what do I do? And he said, well, what, what do you, remind me again, what do you do now? And he's like, well, I'm a shoemaker. And his response was, make excellent shoes and charge a fair price. And that's goodness. To, to actually care about and be proud of what you do. To do it well. And to do it with integrity and honesty. That's goodness. That's ministry. That's one of the ways that we preach the gospel with our actions and our activity. And we can all do that here and now, wherever we are at. Remembering, again, that our presence is a gift to those around us. You've been there with someone who you can tell is not really paying attention. They're checking their phone. Their, their eyes are glossy. Their, their, their mind is somewhere else. I've been that person. I've been guilty of that. And I'm trying to get better at that. 
I fail at it all the time, almost every day. I'm like, oh gosh, I wasn't as engaged in that. And because I, because again, I'm planning, I'm plotting, I'm doing other things. I'm multitasking and I'm trying to get better about being here and being now. Here, four. Good, four. To be four things. We as believers, as followers of Christ, if you follow Jesus, we are called to be against things. We are to be against injustice, inequality, oppression, abuses of power, untruth, lies, stealing, things that are harmful, violence. We're called to be against these things, to stand against these things. But greater than what we are against is always meant to be what we are for. Like you can't just be against injustice. You must be for true justice and mercy. Scriptures teaches us, it says in the New Testament, that mercy triumphs over judgment. Death will be swallowed up in life and victory. Being against things is important, necessary, but being for things is paramount, more essential. And even see it now playing out, there, there's, all these, there's always these movements. Every, every couple of years, there's this movement to like get the Ten Commandments here and there, and we need to post the Ten Commandments, whatever. Whatever. It's interesting to me that people get so worked up about that. Ten Commandments is largely a list of don'ts. It's important. They're good. But like where are people pushing to get the Sermon on the Mount placed in courtrooms or schools or like the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where he's telling you to be something. Commandments are don'ts. Beatitudes are what you should be and do. Blessed are the merciful. Like let's post that places. Blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus goes through all these radical, like when someone oppresses you and forces you to walk a while, you walk two miles. All these positive, progressive, actives, do's and be's that we sometimes forget. People need to know that we are for them. Even our enemies need to know, hey, we may disagree vehemently with your values or your politics or your stance or whatever. But I'm still for you. You're still a human. You're still a person. You're still a brother, a sister, a sibling. You're still beloved. You still bear the image of God. You still have the divine spark. God still called you good when he crafted you. Amen. We can call people up versus just call them out when we are for them, here for good. Peter talks about it this way in his letter, in the midst of great persecution. See, the church was being heavily persecuted when he wrote this. And there are many, even in our country, like, ah, the church is being, we're not really being persecuted here. Let's not, I mean, it, church is persecuted in other places in the world, absolutely. Right? Here, whatever. But, but in the midst of people being killed and murdered and thrown in prison for their faith, it's interesting that neither Peter or Paul ever pray for changes in circumstance. Like, you don't see them in, in their letters praying that, like, God, can you stop having us being thrown in prison? They're like, when we get thrown in prison, give us faith, give us strength. It's just an interesting nuance. It's totally okay to pray for circumstances to change. Jesus did it at the garden. He's like, I don't want to go to the cross. God, can you change this circumstance? The most holy person praying the most fervent prayer wanted his circumstance changed. And God's like, no, this, this needs to happen. And so it's okay to pray for circumstance changes, and sometimes God grants that. But deeper, stronger than that is if we pray in our circumstances, in the here that we are in, God, give us strength. God, be with us. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel your spirit. Fill me with love. Fill me with courage. Fill me with trust. Peter says this, 1 Peter 3. He says, finally, all of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic or empathetic, as we might say today, too. Love one another. Be compassionate. Be humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. We've heard that, many of us, so many times. Like, yes, amen. That is super hard to do in real life. Amen. Like, have you, have you had someone do something evil to you? Have you been insulted? I, I have, and it's like, ah, oh, you want to, like, get the upper hand. You want to, like, pay back, whatever. At least show you're not some punk who got played. He says, don't repay evil with evil, insert. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. The same word blessing here can be translated good. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit blessing and goodness. And then he begins to quote the Psalms where he says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. 
They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Who is going to harm you if you were eager to do good? But even if you should, he's like, who's going to harm you if you're doing good? But yeah, you, that still might happen. So, but even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Yeah. And then again, he quotes scripture where he says, do not, he quotes Isaiah, he says, do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. I've heard people who get excited about, like, I got to have an answer. They forget gentleness and respect part. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than suffer for doing evil. That's the thing. Sometimes we're like, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes you suffer because we're doing dumb things. I mean, sometimes we make foolish decisions. I've had that. I made a bad choice, and I suffered consequences. God's not punishing me. The universe isn't punishing me. I just, I just, I just did something dumb, and this is a result. But God's like, sometimes you are persecuted. Take heart. For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The early church was famous for this. And they were often ridiculed. See, in, in, in the first century AD, they were being heavily persecuted, imprisoned, murdered, ridiculed, kicked out of business spaces, kicked out of political office, sequestered to the edges of society. Yet the church became famous when something tragic would happen, specifically when disease or plague or an epidemic would hit, which happened all the time in the ancient world. And the wealthy Roman elite would, would escape to their countryside villas to wait it out. The Christian church, which was incredibly diverse, full of the poorest of the poor and wealthy as well, and everything in between, Jews, Gentiles, everything, they would move into those spaces of hurt and pain and sickness, and they would take care of those who were dying and diseased at great risk to themselves. And the Romans, some of them mocked them for this. Like, look at these idiots going into this dangerous spot. And some of them saw something there, something powerful, something good. And that began to spread the gospel like wildfire because even this persecuted group was moving in power to love and serve others. Even those who were persecuting them. When they became sick, they didn't, the Christian church in the early first century didn't care who you were. They went and cared for you. And it was powerful and it was a witness and it was a living out of what Peter said to do here. But again, it has to be done with love. Because even now, sometimes I've been guilty of this. We become social justice warriors or we move to be for these things to bring about a tearing down of oppression or abuses of power or inequity or whatever it is. And we get so vigilant standing for that we forget, once again, the gentleness, the humblest, the love piece of it. Paul says that in, in Corinthians 13, where he says, I could speak in tongues of men and angels, but if I have not love, I'm just a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. What you're working for will, will fade. It will crumble if it's not built on a foundation of love and power by the Holy Spirit. This is a little challenge here from the book of Revelation, chapter 2. There's all these prophecies to these different churches of the day, and it says this. It says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, this is, Jesus speaking, he says, write this. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wickedness, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but who are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered, and you have endured hardships in my name, and you have not grown weary. He lists all these incredible things they're doing. Yet I hold this one thing against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You're here for good, but you're not doing it in love, saturated with love, filled with love. Your grace and your love is not moving faster or further than the truth of your stance. And so it's a call to us to remember that the love must be the centerpiece and the framework for it. 
here for good. Good, we could spend our lifetime talking about what good is. So this is going to be the briefest overview you've ever heard. But in Scripture, specifically in Hebrew, Hebrew tav, T-O-V, word for good. It's a word for a lot of things. Mazel tov, maybe you've heard that. Literally, mazel tov means good constellation, a good star, which has come to mean good luck, good fortune. You'll hear Jewish people, even to this day, congratulate one another with mazel tov. Tov can mean goodness, it can mean blessing, it can mean that which is beneficial, that which brings life. It can be used to translate into the word beauty. And you've heard me preach before about, I love these Christian transcendentals hundreds of years ago who talked about their version of uh, a virtue trinity where they said goodness, beauty, and truth are these interconnected things. That which is most true is also that which is most good, and that which is most good is also that which is most beautiful, and that which is most beautiful is also that which is most true, and they're all connected. And Tov represents all of this truth, goodness, and beauty. I remember when I first became a believer, like 17, 18, I have a lot of these weird thoughts. I was in the shower. I was like thinking about like, what is good? And like, could God ever, could God ever like not be good? And like, well, I don't think so because I think God is the definition of what good is. Like everything that God is, is good. Anything that is not God is not good. And like, he is the standard, the framework, the foundation that all good issues forth from him. And I, and, I, and I read this psalm later that day. It was perfect timing. Psalm 100 verse 5 where it says, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. The defining characteristic right here of who God is. God is good. Steadfast love endures it's not a fickle, temporary love where you mess up and it's gone. His faithfulness to all generations, not just a couple, not just a few, all generations. Sometimes we get so concerned about greatness and, and looking great and, and getting accolades and appearing to be this person who's got it all together and getting affirmation that we sometimes forget just the goodness that we're called to. Goodness that doesn't need to be seen, goodness that doesn't need credit, but goodness that changes things, that transforms things, that is powerful. In the Philippians, Paul calls us to ponder this, knowing that what we think about shapes ourselves. We can rewire our neurological pathways by what we think about, what we meditate on, what we contemplate. Because if you're like me, I watch a lot of shows. Sometimes I watch a lot of dark stuff. The world's dark. And we need that refreshing goodness to fill into our souls. In Philippians, it says this. It says, brothers and sisters, I don't, sorry, I don't think I have a slide for this, but whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is of good report, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And we're not meant to hoard that goodness either. Goodness is supposed to enter us and flow out of us like conduits, just like grace. I heard a quote years ago that said, goodness should be like running water. When water sits in a pipe, it becomes corrosive, it becomes stagnant, bacteria can grow. But when the water is flowing through it, it keeps the pipe clean. And in the same way, when we receive God's goodness and let it flow through us into the world, it's this constant flow of the stream. It keeps us clean and it keeps us noble and pure and it keeps us growing our goodness because goodness begets more goodness. I want to start to end with this final thought, this final concept around goodness. I mean, we just talked about it with, with Susie and Hope for Standing, all these incredible things that we can do in the city. Again, the church is called Jesus, when he begins his ministry in the Gospel of Luke, he pulls out Isaiah and he's, he reads a prophecy of, of saying, like, the year the Lord has arrived and I'm here to set the oppressed free, to free the prisoner, to heal the sick and give sight to the blind. And we're called to do that. Jesus said, whatever you do, the least of these, taking care of the orphan, the widow, the homeless, the imprisoned, those without food, those without shelter, those without rights, those who have been told the lie that they're less, that they're somehow not equal, we are supposed to be this beautiful, inclusive, equal, everyone's welcome at the table church. 
That is who we stand for. This is how we free her for good. And that is, that is a philosophical idea. It is a practical way that needs to be exercised in practical ways. It affects how we live our lives, the laws we fight for, what we do in the world, how we serve. Yeah. And I've centered a lot of my life around that for years. It's how I met my wife through nonprofit work. And it was a beautiful thing. We had this shared passion. But there's a quote I read recently that, that has been really defining how I feel in this season. And it's from the Persian poet Rumi from hundreds of years ago, where he said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. I don't know if that lands with any of you, but that hit me hard when I heard it. As I just said, everything we're supposed to do is essential, important calling. But I discovered in my own life, there are times when that was actually distracting me from doing the inner work that God wanted. Or rather, I was not surrendering to the work God was trying to do within me. See, I think that's a better way to say it. God is desiring to do a transformative work in every one of us. Are you submitting to that? Are you surrendering to it? Or are you so busy doing everything else or trying to ignore that or this or that or distracting yourself that you don't see God who's like, oh, I'm, work I'm working on your ego over here. Or you're wrestling with deep shame over here. Or you just have this envy that you just, you just want what everyone else has and you're just never satisfied because you're chasing this ghost. I want to work on this over here. That's why in the Gospels, when Jesus approaches people, he never heals in the same way twice. And there's a story where this rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he's like, I've done everything right. I've been here for good my whole life. Is it enough to enter the kingdom? And Jesus is like, you've done everything awesome. You lack one thing. Why don't you sell everything and give it to the poor? And the guy walks away sad. We don't know if he did it or not. Maybe he was sad because he sold it and gave it away. Maybe he was sad because he wasn't going to. Sometimes the church has taken that and made a whole doctrine no, not everyone's called to give away all their stuff and give it to the poor, but some of us are. Some of us, where, where our stuff has become our God and the only way to have freedom is to give it away, then yeah, that's, that's the work in you that God wants to do. We all have a different version of it. I know some of mine. I don't need to tell you. That's for me and God. But God's working on some stuff. He's been working on some stuff. Every year I find something new. I'm like, oh. Awesome. There's a, new, there's a new thing that I need work on. Thanks, thanks you, Jesus, for that. Yesterday I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise and I'm changing myself. Yeah. Howard Thurman, one of the great pastors in the 40s and 50s, led the first large racially integrated church, talked about how what the world needs most is for people who are coming truly alive. Yeah. When you are being transformed, that transforms everything we touch and we do. There's a lot of quotes I love, like everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change themselves. Yeah. Or everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to do the dishes. My wife and I say that to each other sometimes. <laughs> but there's so much goodness in small and little ways, too, that we can see. And I just want to have eyes for it. There's, this is silly. There's, uh, I live in La Mesa now. Not a, not, a, not a lot of great coffee shop options. It's not like North Park where I used to live where there's like stones throw. There's 10 incredible coffee shops. I've got like two decent ones and there's a couple Starbucks. So there's a Starbucks I go to a lot and there's a woman who works there. She's an older woman. She, she's from Japan, um, born and raised there, only been in the U.S. recently and her name's Eri. And um, she changes her hair color like every week. Yesterday it was bright red. And whenever I walk in, she gives me the biggest smile. She calls me Mr. Mark. And she's like, oh, she's she just, she, I won't say her, her voice, but she's like, Mr. Mark, she's <laughs> I almost did it. That could have been terrible. Um, but she just welcomes me in. Like, even if I don't see her, she'll, like, come around the counter and come up to my table, and she always bows, and I bow back, and I'm like, oh, hello, Ari. We have this moment, this exchange. We rarely talk about anything other than that little thing, and it's so wholesome. It's so human. And I've gone in just sad. I've gone in distracted. I've gone in stress, and then I see Ari, and she calls me Mr. Mark, and she bows to me, and I say, hello, Ari. It's great to see you. I bow to her. We have this exchange, and I feel a thousand times better. And it's like, here for good, 
she's, she's using here her Starbucks job to be for good in the smallest of ways. I don't know. I should ask more about her life. Part of me is just I like to keep this little magical thing that we have. But there's goodness everywhere. There's truth everywhere. There's beauty everywhere. My wife and I, we were very lucky and blessed that we got to go t- two weeks ago to Hawaii for like a little four and a half a day baby moon. Someone gave us plane tickets and we got good deals and everything else. And it was, we packed a lot and it was incredible. We, we laughed a ton. We made a bunch of memories. We took some fun photos. We almost died driving the road to Hana. That was exciting. Um, I really wanted to go on a helicopter tour. And my wife was like, no way. I'm like, babe, like, don't you want to take baby girl on her first helicopter ride? And she's like, no. So she, we, we ended up doing it. And on top of that, when we were booking them, there was like 10 companies, and one company has doors off. It's the only one in Maui that had doors off. I'm like, well, if we're going to go in a helicopter, I don't want doors. <laughs> I want to see everything. And so Lauren agreed to that, and it was great. It was beautiful, and we're seeing the wonder, the goodness all around us. And then our pilot's telling us stories in the headphones about his kids do this and that. And then, he's, then he starts talking about his grandkids. And then he starts talking about his great-grandkids. And I'm like, great-grandkids, how old are you? <laughs> Like, are you a presidential candidate? Is that how old you are? <laughs> and I wasn't afraid until that moment because I'm like, what if what if something happens to this guy? We we're done. We're dead. This this great grandfather. Like I'm praying for his heart. I'm praying for his bodily. Stupid tangent, but there was goodness. There's beauty all around us, and I was soaking it all in, and it was making me feel good. God's doing a work inside of us. And to continue with our good buddy Peter, in 1 Peter 2, he says this. He says, as you come to him, Jesus, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, who was rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, you've heard me say the word there, Petros. He's like, you are little, little Peter's. You are being built into a temple of the Holy Spirit to be a holy priesthood. You see, again, Jesus, his favorite topic is talking about his kingdom that is, has come and is, and is still coming. And he talks all about his kingdom, his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and the new heaven and the new earth. It's all over scriptures. And I'll end with this. It's interesting to me. I'm like, what is the new heaven? What is the new earth? Oftentimes we thought we just are supposed to get sucked up to this faraway place, but Jesus is always talking about heaven coming down to earth. And Jesus was the first example of heaven coming down to earth. And when you really like, what is heaven? Heaven ultimately to me is defined as the place that God dwells. Heaven is the place where the divine exists. And if that's true, when we become a temple of the Holy Spirit, we become pieces of the new heaven. When we become the place that God dwells, we become little slices of new heaven on earth. And then going on, talking about this kingdom, I love it in, 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 the, in the book of Luke, it says this, once when Jesus was being asked by Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that you can observe, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. It's not gonna be some political boundary thing. He says, because the kingdom of God is within you. It is in your midst. When we accept the grace and salvation, the forgiveness and the new life of Jesus, we become part of that new kingdom. And finally, finally, I love this new earth. What is new earth? When you look at the beginning of all things, the stories in Genesis, It says, God, the divine, the all-powerful one, Yahweh, took dust and he formed man. The Hebrew for man is Adam. We call him Adam. That wasn't really a name. It was more of a title. Adam just means man. And the word for earth, for soil, for dust, is Adama. The exact same root. They have the same etymology. It's the same word, essentially. So God's taking Adama, he's taking dust, he's taking earth, and he's making Adam, he's making man. He's taking dust and making dust, he's taking man, he's taking man, he's taking earth, he's making earth. And then he breathes his ruah, his living Holy Spirit into it, and he animates and life springs forth. And in the new way, when we accept Jesus into our souls, we are once again given the Holy Spirit to infill us, to indwell us. And we once again become new life. We become new creations, new heaven, new earth. Paul says it like this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has already come. 
The old is gone, the new is already here. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to give you some fancy whatever. This is scripture. If you're in Christ, the new creation has already come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. For God made him who had no sin be sin for us, talking about Jesus, so that in Jesus, we might become the goodness of God. Wild. We become the goodness of God when we come alive in Christ. How do we do that? Go talk amongst yourselves after this sermon. Go pray about it. Go research. For me, I'll end with this. Like it's getting close to Jesus. How do you get close to anyone in your life? Spend time with them. Like be honest, have not, not just like quality time. Engage, ask questions, listen, converse, ponder, wrestle. Learn about them. Learn about the things they did and like and value. That's how you get close to anyone. And do the same with Jesus. And then do what he says. He says, hey, uh, my command for you is that you love. Yeah. What does it mean to love? I don't know. There's a million ways to love. But it starts with asking that question. It starts with pursuing. It starts with trying. It starts with engaging, like I already said, with Jesus in a real way. It's how you build relational intimacy. It's how you build a connection. It's how you build something real. And as that begins to happen, and as the Holy Spirit fills us, like Jesus said, good fruit will be produced. Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the fulfillment of all law. Love. Being here for good. And then our lives can finally become eulogies. Good words in all of our spaces, in all of our hears, for all the things God calls us to and all the goodness that God creates for us. I'm gonna end with this. If you don't mind, um, if you're comfortable, I invite you to stand if you, if you want to and close your eyes. And I'm gonna read over you a prayer from scriptures. Again, yesterday was the apostle day, the same day for both Peter and Paul buddies who talked about each other in their letters and in glowing terms. This is a prayer from Paul over all the church, then and now, over you. And I invite you to close your eyes and I'm going to pray this over us. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever.